Hey everyone, it's Mojax back in the DJ City UK lab. Got a bit of a special episode for you today. Believe it or not, this is the 200th episode of Tips and Tricks that I've produced with my DJ City family, an unbelievable number. It's also the last video of 2018. 2019 is just around the corner, new year, new horizons. So I've decided it's time for a bit of a refresh here on the back wall. I love my shelves here full of my favorite old toys and my favorite old DJ toys as well. So I'm gonna pull it all down, rearrange some stuff, put some other bits in there, etc. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna talk you through some of these mixes that are here on the back wall because all of these have a story to tell, whether that is their contribution to DJ culture as a whole or to my career as a DJ. There's lots to talk about with all of these. Let's get into it. First up, we have the mixer which gets commented on the most. It's the oldest model I have, dating back to the 1980s, the Realistic 32-1101A. This was one of Radio Shack's in-house brands, and there were a few varieties, including the 1200 series, which had a crossfader. This one can be powered by AA batteries, which I guess means Realistic invented portableism over 30 years ago. This was actually a little before my time, but I do have very fond memories of Radio Shack, or rather Tandy as it was known in the UK. It was one of the few places on the high street where young Mojax could go and drool over DJ kit in the flesh, and I did buy quite a few bits of gear there over the years. I scored this particular unit from eBay for about 20 bucks, and was delighted to find it was completely box fresh. Judging by the condition, I'm pretty sure it's never been used. Next up we have the Gemini Scratchmaster PMX10. It's of 90s vintage, and at that time Gemini mixers were much loved by many. These days they're seen more as a budget brand, and indeed you can still buy a current but rather different PMX10 today. This was another bargain eBay find for me, although I'm still on the lookout for the rather more fetching and pricey Jazzy Jeff signature model from the same era, which has wood trim on the sides and just looks awesome. Although it's called a scratch master, the faders, like most at the time, weren't very hot, so a lot of cuts were done using the phono and line switches instead. Sadly, on this one, they weren't replaceable, as they were on some other models. In a similar vein, and from around the same time, was my first proper DJ mixer, the Cam GM25. Well, mine was the Mark I, not like this Mark II, but there's really not much difference. Cam was a British brand with a cool slogan by 90 standards of made to fade, and for quite some time, their mixers were pretty much the standard choice to accompany your new decks in the UK. As with the Gemini, the faders weren't great, but as simple as the GM25 was, it always got the job done, and mine lasted me for years. The next mixer is incredibly important to the history of DJing in general. For quite a while, the DMC PMX2 was the mixer you had to use in the DMC Championship, so it played host to some of the most legendary routines of all time by default. Made by manufacturer Melos, there is another model out there, the PMX2A, which has a crossfader curve adjust, but on this one, you've just got transform switches, not phono line switches for those crispy transformer scratches. I never owned a PMX2 in the past, but one had to take a place on my shelf, if nothing else because whenever I see it, it makes me think of the world finals in 1992, when the Rocksteady DJs changed the whole DJ game in just six minutes. On the shelf for the same reasons is the Technics SHEX 1200. My buddy Mr. Remix already covered this one in depth on his classic DJ gear series for DJ City, so I'll leave it at that. As the required mixer for the DMC Championships in the years after the PMX2, again, it was automatically home to some of the dopest DJ performances ever. Newmark had to be represented on the back wall somehow, of course. They've had lots of innovative products over the years. I have a couple of Newmark mixers on the shelves. Firstly, the DM2002X, which was a hugely popular intermediate mixer in the early 2000s. After you'd moved on from a basic two-channel job, this was a common choice. Some pretty cool stuff on here. Replaceable, rotatable phono line switches, transform buttons, as again, the faders weren't so hot, kill switches, and even an effect send. If any younger viewers are wondering what the socket is on the top right, that was for a gooseneck lamp, not something we see much anymore. But undoubtedly the coolest feature of this mixer was that it was available fully chromed out. A fingerprint magnet, but it looked sick. The second new mic I have is the EM260, which is notable by dint of having a Korg Chaos Pad stuck in the middle of it. I never used one at the time, and this one had a smashed up screen when I bought it, but still a really nice piece of history, and a rare example of a successful collaboration between two distinct big brands. 
Any story of DJ Mixer developments would have to include Stanton. Pretty much a dead brand now, the company put out some crazy innovative gear around about the turn of the century, with much of it down to the inventiveness of DJ Focus. And this is his signature mixer, the SA8. Designed with the scratch artist in mind, this one includes a stupid amount of ahead of its time features, including separate channel outputs for multi-track recording, a rumble filter, post fader and automatic cueing, and optical switches instead of regular transform switches, effectively mini faders. It comes with both Penny and Giles and Focus crossfaders, with the Focus fader being by far the best fader from that era in my opinion. I'd love to get this one working to actually demo it sometime, but it needs a very weird power supply which I don't have and I can't find one on eBay, so sadly that's not likely to happen anytime soon. On the subject of scratching, obviously Vestax has to be represented. I have an 06 Pro, but that's pretty commonplace, so on the shelf instead goes this PMC005. This particular unit is in a very sorry state, but it's a good representative of the kind of things the Japanese company were doing before the 05 and the 06 set the template for most battle mixers to come after them. This split angle top panel design was fairly commonplace in the late 90s and certainly makes it stand out from today's mixers. My only regret with this one is that it isn't the transparent blue or yellow Mark II variety which look absolutely phenomenal. Perhaps some younger viewers might not be aware that Vestax weren't just about scratching though. They had a long history of making really solid club mixers too. The PMC46 was originally designed by Louis Vega from Masters at Work and this is the later Mark II model. It's actually the only mixer I'm showing you here which I bought with the intention of using not just displaying and it does work, just needs a little TLC. It's a real all-rounder with a crossfader alongside the rotary faders and a ton of inputs and outputs. Shortly after buying it, I picked up a Yuri 1620 LE which fully satisfied my rotary lust, but the 46 is still a great representation of the other side of Vestax. And so we finally move on to a mixer which many DJs outside the UK might not even be aware of, let alone have used. Intimidation were a British manufacturer who made a series of insanely innovative mixers, starting with the Challenger 1 in 1993, then the Don 2 in 1994, and this one the Blue, which came out in 1995. As far as I know, they were the first ever to feature automatic BPM detection, EQ kill switches, and rotary kills on DJ mixers. The designer of the Intimidation line even lays claim to being the true inventor of digital vinyl systems, although that's a rather contentious area which I wouldn't want to get into here. Either way, I very much desired a blue in the late 90s. Ed Craig, who is now half of internationally renowned production duo The Wide Boys, had a record store in the next town over from me, and I would regularly go there to buy happy hardcore vinyl from him and lust over the blue that he had set up with the shop decks. Intimidation only released one more product after this, the Apex, a 10-inch rotary mixer with some cool effects and a crossfader. One day I will find one of those at a display-only kind of price, and that will take its place next to the blue on my shelf too. An important important but often forgotten company. So there you go, a look at some of the classic hardware that I love having on display here at the DJ City UK Lab. I do think it is important to look back at this stuff from time to time. I think as much as I love new technology and pushing things forward, if you don't understand and acknowledge the history of the culture that you're involved with, then you are destined to just repeat stuff forever. You're never really going to move forward. So whether you're an old head or a new DJ just getting into the scene, I think it's important to understand the stories that this hardware does have to tell. Now, this is the last episode of 2018. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's watched, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, over the past year, it really is appreciated. And on behalf of everyone at DJ City, I wanna wish you a happy holidays and a happy and prosperous 2019. I'll see you next year.